Hey everybody, today I'm really happy to have with me a guest who can talk about the importance of design to multifamily investing. I'm really happy to welcome Lisa Landry to the show. Thanks welcome. for having me. So uh, just really briefly, uh, just tell our audience in you know 30 seconds who you are and what it is that you're doing right now. Yeah, I have two different companies. One is an interior design firm called Landry Designs that I started actually 25 years ago and started out in residential and commercial and worked into multifamily about 15 years ago. And then I started another company a few years ago called Above and Beyond Multifamily, where I'm investing in multifamily and uh, then moved up to GP and even asset manager. And so running both of those businesses at the same time, utilizing the skill set from my design company to really add value and, and increase the NOI and the actual value of multifamily properties. So leaping off from there, you know, actually the first question I want to ask you uh, is, uh, you know, how, how is it managing two companies? I mean, they're obviously, they're, they're in related businesses, but it's not exactly the same. They're probably very different skill sets, different teams that you have involved. So how do you, how do you, how do you do that? How do you manage two kind of distinct companies like that? Yes, and it can be very challenging, but I really prepped for it before I started this second company. I made sure that I had infrastructure in place with Landry Designs where I have management team there. We have a team of about 20 and I have managers that run it on a day-to-day -day basis and I am involved as much as I need to be. And I go in once a week and lead the team meeting, um, make sure that you know everything's going smoothly and, and check in on it daily actually. But then I spend you know, the other 50% of my time running the multifamily side of things and, you know, doing capital raising, deal finding, underwriting, asset managing, marketing, all the kinds of things that come with multifamily. And so I'm, I'm really just about 50% in, in each business. And, and so how did you build that structure? Because I think, you know, this, so this is like, a lot of people want to get to this point, right, where their business can, can kind of run without them, right? It sounds like, it sounds like as long as you're there to provide particularly for Landry Design, if, as long as you're there to provide the high level guidance and kind of be the ultimate decision maker, the company kind of runs on its own. So how did you, how did you get it to that point? I think primarily it's systems, making sure that you have extremely uh, detailed and organized systems in place so that it's not, you know, revolving around one person. Um, you, you have to make sure that you're not the one running the business on a day-to-day -day basis. And that just takes developing all your systems, implementing them in a way that's replicatable, um, having extremely detailed descriptions of every single job position in our company, which there are many. We, we have warehouse people, we have design assistants, we have designers, we have managers, we have receptionists, all these kinds of things. And so making sure you have very, very detailed descriptions about What's supposed to happen in every case? And that that's the most time consuming part of it when you're building a business is not having you be the worker, you know, the worker be in the business and overseeing the big picture of the business. So when I started looking at adding this multifamily company, I really had to make sure that the management piece was in place. I had a bookkeeper already, but, you know, I was there every day. I was at the studio every day running the business. And so if I was going to pull out and start this other company, how did I make sure that the day-to-day -day was taken care of? And so I had to spend a lot more time developing these systems, putting into place, this is what you do when this happens, this is what you do when this happens, this is what you do when this happens, um, and then keep adding to it. As we come across things that weren't there, then you know, continuing to add to it and putting lots of different stop gaps in place so that things don't fall through the cracks and checking in on this management team daily to make sure that everything is running smoothly and um, yeah, they get better and better and better over time. So it's it was challenging actually for that first year to make sure that everything was running smoothly and to keep running this other company at the same time. So I worked a lot of extra hours, but now it's it's in place and running much more smoothly and we're actually expanding. We on our Landry design side, we decorate projects across the country because with multifamily, we found that a lot of people buy in the Dallas Fort Worth area, which is where we're located. But then they'll go ahead and buy a property in Atlanta too, or Alabama, or Arizona, or Nashville, and they are Houston, and they want us to come and, and take care of that property also. So we've put infrastructure in place now in those cities and a lot of those cities where we can handle projects in those areas smoothly. So you mentioned systems a couple of times. Can you give 
us some examples of the kinds of systems that you implemented in order to allow the business to run with a lighter touch from you? I think mainly just job descriptions, very, very detailed job descriptions, and lots and lots of checklists for those job descriptions. For example, um, we have what's called a job checklist, and that there might be 100 items on it that happen from the beginning to the end of the job whenever we have a project with a, a customer. We also have lots of different, like we use Google Drive for everything, where we can all share documents and see everything, you know, at the same time in real time, so that that's accessible and, and efficient. Um, we also have a great CRM. Um, we have, you know, a project um, computer system through Intuit, which is QuickBase, actually. We call it Design Base, where we track every single job from beginning to end. There might be 100 items on a job that we've sold. And how do you track all of that and make sure that everything's taken care of? We use Google calendars. I can see like 20 different calendars at one time when I look at calendars so that I can see what everybody's doing and make sure that, you know, everyone's staying busy, particularly when you bring on new people. How do you keep them all involved and not wasting time and uh, not having something to do to learn? And so making sure that they can add things to that calendar on a repeat basis. For example, if you have a customer that you've just sold a project to, we want to make sure we're checking in with them every four weeks and letting them know that we're on top of things and everything's going great. And, you know, it's the worst thing to have a customer have to reach out like, how's everything going? You just don't want that. So making sure that we stay on top of it. And that's just one of our checklists with our systems. And I mean, one of the things I've found very helpful is to um, record Loom videos of everything that you do. And then you have like a library of of kind of SOPs or just literally like over the shoulder, this is how it's done. Is that is that something you do as well? Or We do. We have um, what we call our LD University and we have our own private YouTube channel and we record short videos, you know, three to five minutes in some cases, some are maybe 30 minutes because it's a very detailed uh, process, it's something to do with design potentially, but we record, you know, hundreds of those videos and they're in this library so that when we bring on a new employee and you're going to have turnover, I mean, you're going to have new people come, you're going to have people move away, get married, have babies, all those kinds of things. So when you have a new person come, how can they do a lot of, um, you know, self-generated training without you having to do the training for them? And so we have lots and lots of those in all different categories. And that we call it like self-paced learning where when they're not following along with a designer or sitting in on a design presentation or uh, observing or something like that, they are working on their self-paced training constantly. And there's a big long checklist of all these videos that they have to watch. And, you know, then there's little quizzes afterwards. So developing all of that from the training side, I think is super important. And what about the weekly meetings that you run? What are those like? That's our cheerleading time, actually. Um, that's where I make sure that the team has really great energy, that everybody's, you know, doing what they're supposed to be doing, that they're all ramped up and ready to go to get our goals, you know, each month. And we go around, actually, and um, we have our tell me something good, where everybody tells two things from, from last week that they were really excited about or that they enjoyed, and two things for this week that are coming up that they're excited about. So it really gets everybody, um, you know, in a positive frame of mind. And then we talk about anything. We have training there. We have vendors come in and do trainings, um, any challenges that people are having, who maybe is not as busy that could help somebody else. It's very team oriented through the whole thing. And at the end, we actually do a cheer. We create new cheers every single year. Our team creates cheers. We break up into groups. We come up with all these different cheers. And so we always do a cheer at the end of the, the meeting to get everybody started for Monday. We do it on Mondays to get everybody started for the week. And then sort of one last question on this point before we move on. Um, do you sort of, how do you manage like KPIs and stuff? Do you run something like EOS or traction or is some, is some other system that you've implemented to, to help kind of keep the machine going? Yeah, we actually do all of that through QuickBase. Okay. Um, we have our whole, you know, metric system there and we can see everything at a glance and we've developed a lot of spreadsheets over time with using Google sheets so that again, we can all see it. But like, we just came up with a designer scorecard that we're starting to use now that is a monthly scorecard that the designer themselves will have just for them. And they can look at everything on it and try to improve their metrics, you know, month after month after month. So we are very focused on 
all the little details and, you know, reviews, customer service. I mean, all of those sorts of things are important. Design is super important, making sure that that's amazing. Um, and then also, what is the profit margin of the company? You know, what is our closure rate? What, um, you know, how, what's our leads? How many leads are we getting? Where are they coming from? So really assessing all of the marketing side of things too. And, you know, using a digital marketing agency to make sure the SEO is good. There's lots and lots of pieces, as you know, running a business and looking at all of those. And uh, how long did it take you to set this up? Well, I've had the company for 25 years. So from the very beginning, I've just always been super organized and like systems oriented. And I love replicating it. I want people to get the same experience if they work with us. I don't want it to be a different experience if you work with one of our different designers or, you know, if a, if a neighbor calls uh, or another property owner calls, they should get the same type of experience regardless of which designer they get. So making sure that that's in place and that we have extremely high levels of service and, and that's what our expectations are for our team, just replicating that over and over and over again. And when something is not perfect, sharing it, making notes of it, improving it. Um, you know, that that's our goal is to give exemplary service. And I think that's what we're known for. We're known for really dramatic designs, very wow, you know, designs, but also exemplary service. And did the experience of setting up these systems and kind of getting the design side of your business to, to run you know, largely on its own, um, how did that, how did that impact the development of the multifamily business. Um, I, I, I'm assuming that you know having that experience of setting up systems gave you a, a, a jump start on starting the second business. But I wonder if you can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I think you use the same entrepreneurial skills. You know, you still have to set up your website. You still have to set up your CRM. You still have to make sure your systems are, are in place. How are you going to handle all of this? when you're acquiring a property, um, the systems for checklist of, of the acquisition of a property. I'm actually part of a mentorship program, but there was not a really great checklist for all the things that happened during an acquisition. And so I, I just created that myself. And then, you know, after the acquisition, what are the steps? It's very, very systems oriented again and, and not letting things fall through the cracks. And then the next level is, you know, when you're a GP, or an asset manager, and you're managing the property on a weekly basis and even a daily basis in many cases, how do you make sure that, again, your, your residents get exemplary service? And I'm talking about B and C class properties. That's what, what our, our specialty is. How do you make sure the residents get exemplary service, the potential residents get great service and, and want to live there, and your on-site team does not want to leave? That's very expensive. So those are the three things that we focus on from the design side is how do we get potential residents to move in quickly so that we can get the occupancy up really fast? How do we get current tenants to renew at the higher rents that you're going to be asking because you're elevating the property? And how do we make sure that that, that onsite team loves coming to work every day and loves this new environment that they're working in and does not want to leave? Because it's so expensive to train somebody and get a new manager or leasing agent in that the residents don't know. So from the design side of things, that's what I'm always thinking is, you know, yes, we need to look at construction and uh, amenities and asphalt and parking and signage and all those kinds of things. But these other three things are really what quickly drive occupancy up, uh, you know, and rents up and then the NOI up. And so then that begs the question, how do you do that? How do you do those three things? Really curious about that. The first thing that we look at is the website. We always, when we're looking at a property, when we start with a multifamily project, um, we do a complimentary consultation, a Zoom introductory call with the ownership team and the property management company. And we do our research first. So we're looking at the website. What does the logo look like? What is the name? What is the tenant base? What pictures are on the website? How do those look? Would people want to come look at this property? Because that's where people look first. So the website is you know, super important. The next thing is if when we do our on-site visit, how does it look when you drive up? Like, can you find the leasing office? You know, what does the signage look like? Is there directional signage? Then the next thing is, what does the leasing office look like from the outside? We're we're taking a look at everything from 
Um, the walkway as you walk up, is it spotlessly clean? Is that rug in front of the door spotlessly clean? Is the front door freshly painted? Is the handle nice and new? Uh, when you open that leasing office door, does it squeak? These are little things that tell a potential resident that the property is or is not maintained well. So when they walk in, we always say you have about 15 seconds for someone to decide if they might want to even consider living there. So when you walk in the leasing office, and we think the leasing office is the hub of the wheel, it's the most important element, are they immediately greeted and does someone stand up to greet them? That's what sets you apart from other properties. So we always talk to the on-site team about you must stand up to greet, um, you know, as soon as someone comes in. What does it look like? What do they see when they first come in? We don't want them to see like a desk when they first walk in. We want it to be like a lounge where it almost looks like a model home when you walk in, even in B and C class properties. So making sure that transition is done correctly. Um, and then what does it smell like? In many cases you walk in and it doesn't smell good. Maybe it smells like trash that they haven't taken the trash out from the kitchen. Um, even if you just make a cup of coffee at the beverage station and leave the coffee sitting there, that smells better than, you know, trash, making sure the trash is taken out daily. Um, and then what do they hear? So we don't like people walking into a really quiet environment. It just feels awkward, particularly if it's a smaller leasing office. So making sure there's some kind of background music playing, even if it's just on the computer, you know, of the leasing agent or the, the manager that's there. All these little things, people don't know why they choose a property, but they're looking at four to five properties in one day in many cases. They're going from property to property to property. So whatever we can do to make them remember, oh, this was that one that had the super cool chandelier when you walked in or the blue lounge, or uh, that was that one where that leasing agent stood up and came over and said, hi, you know, these little things set you apart. And that the property that I'm an asset manager on, um, you know, it was a C-class property. We've brought it up to a B. Uh, it's hundred percent occupancy. We continue to raise rents because we don't want to be at hundred um, percent, but it's just very low turnover. Uh, we've elevated the tenant base, the Leasing office is amazing. The model unit is the next thing we typically look at, the model unit. The unit interiors, you know, it doesn't have to be expensive to do these changes necessarily, but what does it visually look like and, and how does it feel? So leasing office is really first, model unit and uh, unit interiors, but we're also looking with the on-site team or the ownership team at the exterior. What does the paint look like? Are you going to paint the brick? Do you just need accent colors? Um, every little thing, there's even, even the trash that's around the property. A lot of times when we walk these properties, we notice that there's certain areas that there's trash that people have just like dumped their lunch, you know, their bags or whatever. And so we always recommend putting a trash can in that area. And that's just such a small thing. But when you put a trash can in the area, they use it. If there's no trash can and they have to walk real far, then you've got trash, you know, on your property. The other thing that we always look for is what we call tiny trash. And that's the little tiny things that get dropped everywhere, like in the flower beds. It could be cigarettes. It could be all kinds of small things, little bottle caps, different things like that. If that tiny trash is not kept up with on a daily basis, it just inundates the property and it looks so poorly maintained. So um, we, we want to take you know, a B or C class property and elevate it to the maintenance level of an A class property and then you know, elevate all of the, the amenities as well. Uh, I've got so many questions about this. This is great, uh, but you know, so on a, on a really practical level, I mean, I I have you know from experience that sort of the battle against small trash is like really hard to win, right? It's very difficult to to get your team to like be out there every day looking for the trash to really like feel ownership over that. And and so how do you how do you get your team to, to do that? Yeah, what I do, again, I become the cheerleader. Uh, I do an on-site visit to that property every two weeks, and I get with the maintenance guy because he's the one doing it. It's a smaller property. It's like 108 units, and so he's the one walking the property every morning, and he is picking up all the bigger trash, but this tiny trash was just growing and growing, you know, so I got with him, and, and I just said, you know, Ignacio, let's walk this, and let's walk it together, and this is what I'm seeing. Like, this is what I call tiny trash. Could you please you know, over the next few days, focus on one area of the property at a time and get all the tiny trash gone. Um, and then you can maintain it. It's so much easier to maintain if you when you do your, your daily walk. And that's what we always require is that daily walk 
of trash just around the property in general, including outside the gate, including at the monument sign, that, that area is super important too. So, you know, recently we were working on this with him and um, the next time I went, I mean, I found like three little tiny things instead of a hundred tiny things and, you know, walking with him again and, and, and him just reaching down to grab it real quick and uh, just praise and praise and praise like, oh my gosh, you, you've, you've got a handle on the tiny trash. Now you're, the property is just looking so amazing. So it's that pride of working there and working in a nice environment and knowing that you elevate the tenant base. We bought this property almost two years ago and the tenant base is completely different. You know, we had a lot of trash just dropped everywhere and now we've put in trash cans in different locations and um, elevated the rents where you get a little bit higher, you know, higher end client anyway. I mean, they're still working class people, but they maintain the property more than the people who lived there before. Well, you know, there's that whole, it's like that broken windows theory, right? I don't know if you're familiar with this, but you know, this idea that when people see an environment being kept clean, then they want to keep it clean themselves, right? Whereas right. if they see broken stuff, they start thinking, well, nobody cares, so why should I? And so when you do those little things, it really encourages your tenants too to kind of have more pride or just at least respect for the area because they they see everyone else is taking care of it. So they don't want to be the one who's not, right? So that's so true. Yeah. I and was wondering. Friends, oh, go they ahead. Have friends. Go ahead they have friends and family visit, you know, and so this is their home. And if we can make it be really nice and well-maintained and that we take pride and that we're constantly going around and picking things up and making sure then, and also the onsite team getting to know the residents really well, and, and they just don't want to hurt their feelings or make more work for Ignacio. You know, he's the right. one that takes care of them when their air conditioning isn't working. And he's the one that shows up right away and fixes it and things like that. Yeah, I was also reminded of, I don't know if you've heard this story, but the, you know, there's, it was Led Zeppelin or somebody that when they used to tour, they had this clause in their contract that they had to have M&Ms in their room, but the green ones had to be removed. And people thought that this was like really arrogant, you know, why, why are they taking out the green M&Ms? But it was just, it was a test, like, because they, the idea was that oh. if, if, if the green M&Ms were gone, it meant that whoever was, it had read the contract. Right. Yes. So, so that's what it was about. It wasn't about the green M&Ms could have been anything, but it was the point was, OK, they, they caught this detail. So obviously they're detail oriented. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if there's any anything that's the tiny trash reminds me of that green M&M story. The other thing that that come, that brings to mind is our um, bark park. We put in a bark park. It was just a little strip of grass. It's not a huge bark park. Um but there was not a bark park there before. And there's a lot of pets on this property. And so we made a, a really nice bark park. We put a seesaw in there. We put a fire hydrant in there. There's a bench in there. There's cute little signage in there. Um, but we noticed that the trash, the waste dispenser or the waste area just was a thing where you pulled the bags. Like it just had the bags. There was no trash to put the waste in. And so nobody picked it up. You know what I mean? Or they would put it in the bag and then just like drop it on the ground. There was no trash there. So just switching out that one little component to include the trash where they could put it in and then keeping that emptied daily, it, which is super important too, because you don't want to be drawing flies and, and that kind of thing. But adding that one element just made it be so nice. They they pick up their waste, their pet's waste now. So you, you, you you've really... I mean, I was already interested in design to sort of start out with, and 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 I'm really fascinated by the impact of design on 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 business, right? But you, you've kind of expanded my mind a little bit about what what is included in design because you know you're talking about the smell when you walk in, the sound when you walk into the the uh, you know the leasing office, the tiny trash. I mean, all that when you think about it, it really is a, a part of the design too. And what I was thinking was there's a tremendous amount of psychology that you that goes into this, right? When you're talking about where you place the garbage bins or all these different things you mentioned. I'm just wondering, is this something that you studied as part of learning to be a designer or is this just, or you studied on your own or is this just things that you sort of picked up along the way? Like where does all this knowledge of the kind of psychology of it all come from? Yeah, when I was growing up, I was just so interested in making my room look and feel a certain way. And, and I'd help my little friends and we were always moving furniture around and that kind of thing. And I think looking back on it now, I was very, very affected by my surroundings. And I think all of us are to some extent, very affected by our surroundings, our mood, 
uh, our happiness, if we feel comfortable or don't feel comfortable, what colors is it? All those kind of things are super important. When we work in residential, we always talk about color with the homeowners because what colors would they wear? What colors would they not wear? Uh, I worked in, in, I was a clothing buyer for years before I started this business and our colors that we wear can look good or bad on us. And so we want to make sure that particularly the hostess of the home looks really good in the backdrop of her home. And, you know, with multifamily, it's different because there's lots of different kinds of people coming in. So we want to make sure that we're, you know, making things look great that appeal to men and women, particularly women are the ones who make the decisions usually about where you live, where they're going to live. So you have to appeal to them. Um, but we want to make sure that the men like it as well. So it's a little bit different, you know, in multifamily. So that, that feeling of how do you feel when you come into a space is super important. I've had a lot of sales training in my lifetime, also working in retail for many years and in and, and the business that I'm in now. And so the psychology of sales is super important. And we just don't want to do anything that makes people not want to live there, you know, in these communities. It's, it's the things that are wrong that they're going to notice, not all the things that are right. So as an asset manager, I do think it's important to have frequent on-site visits, whether they're surprise visits or they know you're coming and it's good to mix up both because when they don't know you're coming, you see how it really is. When they do know you're coming, you see how well did they do when they knew I was coming? Do I, am I still finding things? Um, I was at our property last week and our on-site manager is out on maternity leave. And so we have a sub there right now. So I've been walking the units with her. We only have two units open right now, um, but we walked those two units. The first one that we walked in, it wasn't quite ready, but it was getting close. It smelled like smoke, you know, like a smoker had, had lived there. And my first question was, why don't we have the ozone machine in here yet to remove this smell? Because that takes like two days of running it, you know, to get rid of the smell. And she was like, oh, I didn't even know we had an ozone machine. So um, that, that was one. We walked to the second one. And it smelled like dog, like wet dog. So again, that should have had the other ozone machine, you know, running in it. And, you know, I told her, would you want to live here with this smelling like this? Like, I couldn't live in this space with it smelling like this. And she's like, no, I know you're right. You're right, Lisa. You know, I'm so glad you pay attention to these details. But that's what you're training them to do is pay attention to the details. And now those two people have already moved into those units, the new residents. And, you know, they're just super happy and there's no smell. But it's the little things that we're affected by. And I'm, I'm curious sort of how this translates into higher rents or higher profitability, like uh, just in a little bit of a roundabout way of you know, example. Like I, I really like coffee shops, spend a lot of time in, in coffee shops. And I've noticed how, you know, the coffee shops that invest the money in really, really good design are always full and they can charge more money for the coffee. Same basic coffee but just like the environment is so good that you want to be there and they can make more more money and it always sort of makes me feel sort of a little mystified about the people who take the opposite approach of like oh they just we don't want to spend the money you know whatever right they they don't they they don't have the, or they they feel it's too risky to spend the money right so uh and they don't really understand how the the design translates into profit so i'd love you to talk a bit about that I think what the case is in multifamily is that it's primarily men in this industry and they love doing the business plan. They love the acquisition process. They love, you know, getting all the construction money and having all these fun, masculine, you know, cool things to do to uh, add a soccer, you know, place or a soccer field, add um, the Bark Park, add, you know, redo this asphalt, change something with the mailboxes, you know, exterior construction of fences and all those kinds of things. And I do think those things are important, but they, in many cases, ignore the design side. And the design side is what makes people want to live there or not. Um, again, people are looking at a lot of different properties. So if we can set it apart, I think it's super important. And in the leasing office in particular, they'll tell me, like when we start with a new group, a new ownership group, they'll say, well, Lisa, why would we spend that money on the leasing office? People don't even use the leasing office. It's like they can you know, do pay their rents online. They can put their maintenance request in online. So it's just, you know, the on-site team is there. And that is so not the case because we're on site with these properties all the time. There is a revolving door in all of these properties. 
And I don't know why they all come in, but there are a lot of people in that leasing office and it's potential residents coming in to take a look. Um, it's current residents coming in to just talk and they're bored sometimes and they just want something to do. And uh, maybe they have a question about the maintenance request or they have a question about payment, you know, situations, all those kinds of things. So it's very, very used actually. And, and in addition, the on-site team works there every day. They're there for, you know, a third of their life, eight hours a day. And so how does it look and feel to them? And are they proud of where they work? And do they feel comfortable charging these higher rents? And they do because the property has been elevated. So they're small things, but how can we make the leasing office look like a model home when you walk in, like really dramatic, like so memorable that you cannot forget it? We always recommend doing that first, the leasing office first, to get those uh, redone spaces professionally photographed and get those images on the website as fast as you possibly can, because you don't want to spend the money and then not do the professional photography and get those images on the website. And when we start with a new group, in many cases, they haven't budgeted enough for us to do what we need to do and to really make the transformation. They might, you know, say, well, we have this much. What can we do? And we do it and they see, well, even that made some difference, but not as much as it could have. And then on their next property, we, we, we actually have a, a menu of services that has budget ranges they'll plug in the correct number, you know, for the next project. And then we can make a huge transformation. And so then what we see is very quickly, the occupancy goes up. And then once the occupancy goes up, you can start raising rents. And most of the properties that we have helped with sell within two or three years. And, you know, they're just, re- they just get such a great offer that they're ready to move on to the next property. So I do think you get a huge ROI using design um, and, you know, just making sure you leave some budget for us to to make that difference. If you either have a limited budget or you didn't think about this enough beforehand, what is like, if there's one single thing, well, let's just say for whatever reasons, there's, there's only one thing that a par- apartment owner can do that for whatever reason, time, money, budget, you know, whatever it is. So there's just one thing they can do. What, what, what would your advice be to them? Like the one thing that they absolutely must do that that's going to give them the biggest like ROI? Yeah, I would say the leasing office. Uh, Second to me would be signage because that's a first impression space also. Like what does the signage look like when you come in? But you can sort of get past that if the leasing office looks amazing. But those two things really go hand in hand. That's your image and your branding. And so I guess if I had to say one thing, it's image and branding. Like what, what is your potential, you know, customer or current customer seeing? What do they think of you? Um, even little things like we do something that costs nothing. We do a monthly newsletter for our residents and we print it and we put it on every door and that doesn't cost but 30 bucks or something, but it's something that has like free events in the area that are going on that month. Um, resident, like a, like a very inexpensive resident event that you can do monthly, um, you know, tips for apartment owners, all these things cost so little but make a big impact on the community feel for the property. Um, Little things like the swimming pool, if you have a pool in your property, how does the furniture look? So many times we find that people have just gone out and bought like beige pool furniture and stuck it out there and it looks terrible. So we like to add a lot of color to the pool area. We like to add umbrellas. We ask that the maintenance team open those umbrellas every single morning. It should just look like a magazine when you walk by, you know, when you're looking at at properties. And then again, that's on the website. Uh, Adding a small business center to a leasing office, which can be as small as just a desk with a lamp and having that photographed separately so that it's on the amenities list on your website, you know, as a business center. Lots of little things that we can do. And and since we work on B and C class properties primarily, we're used to having, you know, tighter budgets, but where you put the budget, and now as a, as a multifamily owner, I can see they're putting a lot of money in construction and not enough money in the things that people actually see. So we have a little bit of time left. I would like to talk a bit about the multifamily side of your business. So how did you get into that? How did you start? I mean, you obviously were working on multifamily projects before. What was it that made you take the jump into actually you know, being on the owner side? I was investing in the stock market. A good amount. And I was so stressed all the time. It's very volatile, the stock market. 
And uh, my dad is actually a commercial realtor and he has a bunch of single family homes. My son is a, a real estate investor and he has some single family homes and Airbnb. Now he's doing some residential assisted living. And so both of them were like, well, why don't you just think about investing in real estate? I thought, well, I should invest in real estate. And so I started researching like the asset classes. You know, there's mobile home parks and self-storage and commercial buildings and single family homes. And I had no interest in the single family home space. I mean, that is so much maintenance for people to handle themselves. And the scalability is just nil. You know, in my opinion, it's very difficult to scale. Um, so I came across multifamily and I was like, well, I know something about multifamily. I've been doing this for you know 15 years. And so I started researching. I started listening to tons of podcasts, you know, like you, uh, like yours. I, I went to what I call podcast university. Every spare moment I had, I was listening to multifamily podcasts. And I learned so much about the industry through those podcasts, about the terminology, the process. I mean, just so many different things. So then I started watching YouTube videos. Then I started reading multifamily books. And then I ended up going to a bunch of multifamily events. I just wanted to see what all this was about. And so I started going to different events and joined a mentorship program, actually, where then I got the connections and the network of people that I might could potentially invest with or partner with. So I invested first as a limited partner. Um, and just went through that whole process. I wanted to see what it was like and learn and, you know, see what did they send me every month? And did I get any cash flow and all those kinds of things, the good, the bad and the ugly, and then decided, yes, I am ready to take on, you know, a role as a GP. And that during that period, I had been preparing my other business to not be so involved and just went in, you know, feet first and just learned as much as I could. And and what I bring to the table is the background that I have with multifamily and overseeing all the CapEx. Also, I do a lot of like sales and marketing for my other business. So the sales and marketing piece of it and the capital raising, you know, is, is what I bring to the table as well. So that's really how I got involved. And um, just, I think it's such a small community, really multifamily is, even though we're across the US, it's really such a small community and we all kind of know each other. And you, you learn the skill set of other people and you don't want to overlap those skill sets too much when you're, you know, creating a partnership, making sure that you have a really good acquisitions person and an underwriter and a financial person for the asset management and then someone that can do the CapEx and someone that can do the marketing and who's going to do capital raising and who's going to do the investor newsletter, you know, update every month. There's lots of pieces and parts and you have to make sure that everyone is covered. So it's been a really fun journey and uh, I'm just looking forward to many, many more years of it. I, I love the thought of, you know, it's a tangible asset, not a paper asset like stocks. Um, so that makes me feel better that it's a hedge against inflation, that it's valued so differently than residential because it's based on the NOI and we can get that up with, you know, manually doing certain things. Um, and then the tax benefits were a great um, boon to me. It, it was very helpful to me to have the the bonus depreciation that multifamily offers. So I think it's the best asset class. Yeah, well, I agree. So it's, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I had wanted to ask you sort of what 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 the future holds for you in this. You know, where where do you see yourself taking this in the next five or ten years? Yeah, I want to just keep acquiring properties. You know, we're in a weird time right now with um, availability of, of deals. Uh, but we're constantly underwriting and touring and looking at deals. And so just want to continue acquiring, you know, the property that I've had for almost two years, we're looking at even potentially selling this next year. Uh, but I want to keep acquiring and, you know, adding to my portfolio. And then on the design side, we're just expanding more and more into to other cities and, and making sure that we can help people grow their multifamily businesses as, as large as possible too. Well, We've run out of time, but that was a really fascinating discussion. I really appreciate it. Everyone who's listening, if you have not been convinced by the importance of design in your multifamily repositioning projects, you know, I, I don't know where you've been for the last 45 minutes, but you should be convinced by now. Um, so Lisa, where can people reach you if they would like to, uh, you know, become part of your world? Yes. If they're interested in the design side, then I would email info at Landry Designs, and that's plural, LandryDesigns.com. If they're interested in investing or in, or joining our investor club through my above and beyond multifamily company, 
then they can send an email to uh, Lisa at growaboveandbeyond.com. That's wonderful. Well, I highly encourage you to reach out to Lisa. Uh, this has been a great conversation. Thank you. I really appreciate your, your time and all of your insights and all this amazing experience that you shared with us today. Thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun.